All right, welcome everyone to this week's meeting of the Clyde Sukforth Chapter of Sabre. I am Bruce McClure, the Chapter Chair, and we always hold our meetings in conjunction with the Gardner Waterman Chapter of Sabre in Vermont, Dr. Clayton Truder, Chair. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to go over one thing with the membership real quick. Recently, the Board of Directors proposed an amendment to the chapter's bylaws, reducing the number of days a ballot will be opened during upcoming elections from 30 days to 14 days. I'm pleased to inform the membership that this initiative passed unanimously and will be forwarded to Sabre this week. Having gotten that out of the way, let's see if anybody has any news and notes that they want to talk about this week. I'm going to, like I always do, Jeff Cohen, I want to talk to you about the pod. What's going on with that? Thank you, Bruce. Yes, Baseball and Barbecue. We have a great uh, podcast this past week uh, with Fred Clare, former D GM of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Has great stories. And uh, you'll be, uh, it was just terrific talking about Jackie Robinson and and uh, his the World Series, you know, to the uh, 88 World Series and him taking over for, for uh, what's his name? Uh, Al Campanis. So uh, yes. it's just a great, great story. So tune in to Baseball and Barbecue for uh, Fred Claire. Thank you. You can get that from any podcatcher that you might use to grab your podcast. Download that today. They are a great listen. Does anybody else have any news and notes that they would like to share with the group this evening? If you do, pop in. Okay. Well, I do want to welcome um, Max's parents to our uh, meeting this evening. They've decided to join us so that they could see uh, Maxwell present tonight. So we're glad you're here this evening. Thanks for coming out. All right. Are we, right. are we are we on? We are on. On with our feature presentation. Here we go. The year was 1968. Having witnessed the impact of the Canadian Centennial Celebration, Expo 67, and Trudeau Mania, 37-year-old Charles Rosner Bronfman, Bronfman, I'll never be able to say that right, aspired to become one of 10 investors in Mayor Gene Drapo's latest grand project, a major league baseball team from Montreal in Canada. Yet in his 22 years with the Expos, the team reached the playoffs only once, an NL East division title in 1981. Our presenter uses primary and secondary source material along with statistical analysis to chronicle the obstacles Bronfman overcame to assume ownership of the Expos and to narrate their progression as an NL franchise. In particular, headdresses why, even as the team of the 80s, the Expos failed to win a championship. Maxwell Cates is a chartered accountant who lives and works in Toronto, Ontario. He has worked in commercial radio in St. Catharines, Ontario, and more recently, he wrote a monthly column for the Houston-based Pecan Park Eagle. Maxwell's articles and essays have appeared in four issues of the National Pastime, and in 2018, he and Bill Nolan co-edited Time for Expansion Baseball. His speaking engagements include Sabre meetings and conventions in Seattle, Montreal, Houston, Baltimore, and the recently completed convention in Minneapolis, not to mention, along with three reports at the Canadian Baseball History Conference, his pre presentation on Charles Bronfman and the Montreal Expos is based on an essay originally published in Our Game 2, a Sabre anthology about the history of baseball in Canada, and Maxwell Cates is here tonight to give his presentation. Max, great to have you. Welcome to Northern New England. Great. Thanks for having me. So I'm just going to turn it over to you. You can hit that share button down the bottom and get started with your uh, PowerPoint. And you're on, my friend. All right. Uh, Bruce, thanks for thanks again for having me. Um, have I got this properly? Yeah, hit I do. Hit share. Okay. And then your PowerPoint. All right. Can you see my PowerPoint? It, if you, You've got to hit the little share button in there, too. So there's three steps. Oh. What about now? Here it comes. There he is. Perfect. Participant, participants can now see your application. You betcha. Can you see my screen? I can. All right. Does anybody recognize this? What I'm holding up. Dixie. Is that Rusty Stobb? Oh, that's that that's rusty stop on, on the um on the powerpoint but does anybody you cannot see, see you we cannot see your uh you, you until the end so we show that at the end for us all right okay sounds good show it at the end 
All right, so let's get uh, started. Bruce, thanks again for having me tonight. Uh, Bruce and I first met two years ago at the Sabre Convention in Baltimore. We've since crossed paths more recently in Chicago and Minnesota, which was where I gave this presentation initially. Uh, it's called The Mayor Was a Salesman, Charles Bronfman and the Expos, 1969 to 1990. They speaking at the, for the Clyde Sooth Fourth Chapter of Sabre. October 7th, 2024. And today being October 7th, I've asked Bruce and have been permission give, given permission to ask for a moment of silence for the one year anniversary that over 250 people were taken hostage from southwestern Israel. Some have since been released. Some have been murdered. A year later, 101 are still in captivity. So if you don't mind, it's now 707. If when we get to 708, a moment of silence, please. Seven oh nine, let's begin. You're ready to go. All right, thanks, Bruce. Just trying to it's like that. Okay. So as as um as Bruce mentioned, this is based on the biography of Charles Brompton, which appeared in our game two. Influential Figures and Milestones in Canadian Baseball, edited by Andrew North. Uh, this when we, when, I, when we had the convention in Minnesota, I had a copy of Charles Bronfman's book uh, distilled to give away, and here was the question. It was, who was the only pitcher in the history of the Montreal Expos to win 20 games in a season? I don't have a book to give away, but does anybody know the answer? Drop it down in the chat if you know. Oh, okay. I was going to say something, but okay. Go ahead, Jeff. I was, I was going to say Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers won 19 in his best year. He never, uh, he never got to 20. Missed it by that much. Missed it by that much. I have two guesses in the chat. Let's see what Bill we Stoneman. Have. Stoneman, I think, won, I think got as high as 16 in 1971. He never got as far as 20. Ross Grimsley. Ross Grimsley's correct. Well done. Eric Zwig and uh, Dennis Garcia. Yep. Ross the Boss. He was the Expos All Star Selection and Player of the Year in 1978. Only pitcher to win 20 games in a season. Rogers, that I mentioned earlier, won 19. Carl Morton and Bryn Smith each won 18. So let's begin. Starting in 1967, Canada Centennial Year. Expo 67s held in Montreal. That time, Charles Bronfman was a 36 year old. Executive with Seagram's, a company run by his father, Samuel Bronfman, since 1928. Charles Bronfman joined Seagram's in 19, 1951 and by 1967 began to think about his legacy. What could he accomplish independently of Seagram's and his family name? You should be able what? to click to keep your slides going. I've had a couple of people message me, sorry. Would it make money, and how could he accomplish this in a way that unified Canadians across the country? The American League voted to expand early in 1968, awarding the new franchises to Kansas City and Seattle. The National League followed suit, awarding new franchises to San Diego and Montreal on May 27, 1968. Bronfman, in the beginning, offered to put up 10%. Three other cities were considered besides San Diego and Montreal. 
It was a foregone conclusion that one of the two expansion teams would be awarded to San Diego. San Diego Stadium opened in 1967 with a capacity of 50,000 for baseball. And with Seattle in the American League, the franchise would give the National League its coveted third West Coast team in San Diego. War Memorial Stadium in Buffalo, New York, home of the AAA affiliate of the Washington Senators. Capacity for baseball, 46,206. But it required a municipal bond in order to upgrade to National League standards. An expansion team in Buffalo would have to pay Cleveland for an indemnity fee. Players did not feel safe in Buffalo, and in fact, in one incident, the Richmond Braves reported that their bus was pelted with rocks as it attempted to leave the stadium parking lot. Another possibility was Turnpike Stadium in Arlington, Texas, home of the AA affiliate of the Baltimore Orioles since 1965. Capacity for baseball was 10,000. It also required a municipal bond for an upgrade to National League standards. Besides that, Roy Hofheinz, who owned the Houston Astros, viewed the entire state of Texas as his territory, and he lobbied hard to keep a second National League team out of Texas. Excuse me, Max? Yep, go ahead. It's Molly. Um, if you are in your Google Slides or your PowerPoint presentation, you're able to advance the slides for us so we can see what you're discussing. You can't see it. We can see just the cover screen of the introduction and it says Mayor um, Charles Bromfin Expos 1969 to 1990. What about now? You should be able nope. to click, so, just click on the screen and it should move them. So Max, get into the file that you're showing on the screen. So click on the tab at the top that has that file. File, yeah. And now try to advance the slide. Can you see it? No, but your presentation's great, so just keep rolling. I'm sorry that I interrupted you. I thought I would try when you were taking a breath. It's okay, what, Max. Don't what sweat about, it. What, what about now? No, it's still not working, Max. I'm sorry. I want to get it working. It would... Oh, there we go, Max. It's working. You got it. All right, so you've heard all this, so I'm not going to repeat it. All right. Now, let's let's resume with our program in progress. Milwaukee County Stadium in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, home of the Milwaukee Braves from 1953 to 1965. Capacity for baseball, 43,768. Already met National League standards and would not require a bond. However, the state of Wisconsin was suing the National League for allowing the Braves to move to Atlanta in 1965. This left us with the fifth city of Montreal. There was Delormier Stadium, which was the home of the Montreal Royals from 1928 to 1960. It could not be rezoned as it was located in a residential neighborhood. The Montreal Alouettes played at the Autostad, but the city had no authority to rezone a stadium that was owned by the federal government. In other words, there was no place to play in Montreal, so why were they giving it a team? Canadian cities, unlike American cities, did not require a municipal bond to build a new stadium. And here's here here was Jean, uh, Charles Bronfman, what he said as he was trying to make inroads with the mayor's office. I'd go to see Drapo, and he would tell me that everything was wonderful. And by the way, when I went to see Drapo, I used to do this. I used to pinch myself and say, he's a salesman, he's a salesman, he's a salesman. Don't believe him, he's a salesman. Then I used to see Sonia, his assistant, and Sonia had two words that were fabulous. They were definitely not. And you can see that interview on YouTube if you want. Was the mayor a salesman? Jean Drapo had, become, had been the mayor of Montreal from 1954 to 1957, and again from 1960 to 1986. When Montreal was awarded the Summer Olympics in 1970, he infamously remarked that the Olympics can no more run a deficit than a man can carry a baby. The Olympics lost $150 million, or $1.5 billion. And so this cartoon appeared in the Montreal Gazette. A very pregnant-looking Jean Drapeau on the phone, Hello, Morgan Dollar! Bronfman eventually put together a team of investors required to finance the expansion fee of $10 million. Journalists Russ Taylor and Marcel Desjardins had demonstrated to a National League president, Warren Giles, 
that Jerry Park, a 3,000-seat facility in the north end of Montreal, could be upgraded to meet the National League standards in time for the 1969 season. Jean Drapeau threw out the first pitch at the first game in the history of the Montreal Expos at Shea Stadium, April 8, 1969. Dan McGinn, Rusty Staub, and Coco LeBoy each hit home runs as the Expos defeated the New York Mets by a score of 11-10. to 10. Front page of the, of the Gazette read, look who's in first place. Six days later was opening day for Major League Baseball in Canada. We see um, the man in, with with the coat and the Xbox cap, that was uh, Charles Bronson's father, Sam, sitting on one side of Lester Pearson. On the other side of him, the man with the mustache, that was Roland Michener. He was the Governor General of Canada at the time. Immediately behind Sam Bronson, there was Charles. Next to Charles was John McHale, the general manager. And a few pe people behind him, that was Brian Mulrooney, long before he became Prime Minister of Canada. And true to my Ottawa roots, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge Gil Greenberg in the houndstooth coat. He was in real estate like the Bronfmans and in philanthropy like the Bronfmans. And there, of course, was Jean Drapeau. Little was expected from the Expos in their first four seasons, uh, 52 and 110 in 1969. 70, they, the big accomplishment was going 70 and 70. Where they were 73 and 89, still in last place. They advanced to the fifth place in 1971, 71 and 90, and fifth place again in 1972 with a record of 70 and 86. The Expos entered their first pennant race in 1973, finishing 3.5 games behind the Mets, despite finishing the season below 500. There was a much bigger story on, on the horizon in 1973, the energy crisis. And austerity measures were felt in and far beyond Major League Baseball. The Expos had their own issues that were unique among Major League teams in that they also had Rene Levesque to contend with. Levesque was the leader of the Parti Québécois, who at that time was the third party in Quebec. He sought to table a referendum on Quebec's status within Canada if he were ever to become elected Premier. And Bronfman vowed to sell the Expos if Levesque were ever elected. Consequently, in 1974, as they were on the verge of contending, they dismantled the team. Players like Willie Davis, Ron Fairley, Ron Hunt, Ken Singleton, and Mike Torres were traded. Checking in were Rich Coggins, Pete Mackinnon, Dave McNally, Don Stanhouse, and several players from the farm system who were not quite ready for the major leagues. Bronfman acknowledged years later that trading Singleton and Torres set the franchise back at least two years. Ken Singleton and Mike Torres combined for a war of 48 between 1975 and 1984, when both players retired. The Expo slid backwards. 79 wins in 1973, 79 again in 74. 75, they went down to 75 and 87. And 76, they went right down to 55 and 107. Free agency replaced the reserve clause as baseball's economic system in 1976, coinciding with the move to Olympic Stadium. The Expos jumped in the free agent market by signing Dave Cash in 1977 and Ross Grimsley in 1978. Despite offering more money than George Steinbrenner, the Expos could not sign Reggie Jackson as a free agent. There's Reggie riding the Metro in Montreal. And what's more, René Levesque won his majority government in Quebec on November 15th, 1976. Blue chip free agents remained an Achilles heel for the Expos. They lost out on Don Sutton to the Houston Astros in 1980, and Willie Randolph to the Los Angeles Dodgers in 1988. The Expos finally field a legitimate contender in 1979. They set a franchise record for wins with 95 and attendance with 2.1 million, eclipsing the break-even point by 400,000. It was a mix of homegrown players, Gary Carter, Warren Cromartie, Andre Dawson, Larry Parrish, Steve Rogers, and Ellis Valentine, along with veterans Tony Perez, Bill Lee, and Woody Fryman. Carter, Parrish, and Rogers represented the Expos at the All-Star Game. But the 79 Expos lacked experience. They were eliminated from the playoffs on the final day of the 1979 season. They lacked a team leader and a bona fide closer, and the Pittsburgh Pirates had both, Willie Stargell and Kent Teculvey. They also played eight doubleheaders in September, losing Gary Carter for the rest of the season when he fractured his thumb in a collision at home plate in one of the twin bills. 
The 1980 Expos contended once again, spending 81 days of the season in first place while drawing in excess of 2 million fans, eclipsing the team attendance record that was set in 1979. Newcomer Ron LaFleur teamed with Rodney Scott to set a record for 160 stolen bases by two teammates. Rene Levesque lost the 1980 referendum on sovereignty association by a margin of 59 to 41, but promised a second referendum. By now, much of the business community who would have sponsored the Expos or subscribed to season tickets had left Montreal. But depth and injuries doomed the Expos in 1980. Key players Larry Parrish, Ron LaFleur, and Ellis Valentine all missed significant playing time in 1980 due to injuries. And the lack of a closer hurt the Expos once again when on October 4th, 1980, Stan Bonson gave up a home run to Mike Schmidt in the 11th inning to eliminate the Expos. This is what I thought hurt the Expos more than anything. After the 1980 season, the Expos were rewarded with a five-year, $35 million broadcasting sponsorship for, for, from O'Keefe Ale through the 1985 season. It was the most lucrative broadcast career in history to that time. Labatt, who sponsored the Blue Jays, filed an injunction with the commissioner's office that their broadcast territory was being infringed. In March of 1981, Bowie Kuhn ruled in favor of Labatt. The Expos were relegated to becoming a regional team, not a national team, which was the antithesis of what Charles Brompton was trying to accomplish in the first place. Talk a little bit about the Blue Jays because it is relevant to the Expos' failure to reach the heights that they had hoped. Uh, the American League voted in 1976 to expand by two new teams. One of those teams would play in Seattle in order to quell a lawsuit filed by the state of, Wisconsin, of Washington. After the Pilots left for Milwaukee in 1970, there was an understanding that Seattle would be awarded a second team by 1976 when the Kingdom was scheduled to open. Toronto narrowly missed receiving the San Francisco Giants in 1976. Charles Bronfman tried to lobby his fellow National League owners to expand in 1976, awarding one of two franchises to Toronto, and this would create a natural rivalry between the two Canadian teams. But Bronfman could not convince three National League teams, the Reds, the Cardinals, and the Phillies, to expand in a vote that required unanimity. Instead, Toronto got the other American League team in 1977. The Blue Jays and Expos would meet only in the meaningless Pearson Cup exhibition game from 1978 to 1986. Charles Bronfman worried that by putting the Blue Jays in the American League, that it would help one of the Canadian teams and hurt the other. He had no idea how right he was. Now we get to the team of the 80s. 1977, they won 75 games. 1978, a little bit better, 76. 1979, they leapfrogged us 95 games. And 1980, 90 games. The Expos continue to retool their roster in 1981, adding Tim Raines. Raines finished second to Fernando Valenzuela as Rookie of the Year, stole 71 bases, and led the National League in steals from 1981 to 1984. The Expos finally acquired their all-star caliber closer in 1981, acquiring Jeff Reardon in a trade with the New York Mets. Reardon was fittingly on the mound when the Expos finally clinched a division title on October 3rd, 1981, versus the Mets. Why Blue Monday was a team effort. Despite Gary Carter batting 438 and Jerry White's home run to win Game 3, the Expos batted 215 as a team in the 1981 NLCS. The Expos provided starter Ray Burris with only one run in Game 5 of the NLCS. The Expos did not want to reveal that closer Jeff Reardon was injured, so they brought in Steve Rogers to pitch the ninth inning. The Expos had two runners on base after Monday hit the home run, two runners on base in the bottom of the ninth, and were unable to score either one. The teams that eliminated the Expos each year from 1979 to 1981, the Pirates, the Phillies, the Dodgers, all went on to win the World Series. Meanwhile, the Expos had another problem on their hands. Gary Carter had emerged as the face of the franchise and perhaps the well-known, most well-known male athlete in Canada after Wayne Gretzky. The three-time Expos Player of the Year was also the 1981 All-Star Game MVP. He was set to file for free agency after the 1982 season and would not negotiate once spring training had begun. Prior to the 1982 season, the Expos signed Gary Carter to an eight-year, 
$16 million contract extension through 1989. It was a deal that neither Charles Bronfman nor general manager John McHale wanted. Does anybody recognize um, Martin Brodeur in the picture? No? Okay. The Expos continued to set attendance records in 1982 and 1983, outdrawing the New York Yankees in both seasons. On the field, they retreated in the standings, finishing in third place in both years and then in fifth place with a losing record in 1984. In one crucial doubleheader against the Phillies late in the 1983 season, Gary Carter went 0 for 8. That's when Charles Bronfman said, maybe they would win if they were owned by somebody else. So first place in the second half of the strike short in 1981 season, third place in 82, third place in 83, and then down to fifth in 85, 84. On December 10th, 1984, three years into the Gary Carter contract, the Expos traded him to the New York Mets. For Hubie Brooks, Mike Fitzgerald, Herman Winningham, and Floyd Yeomans. The Mets, with Gary Carter, won the World Series in 1986. Meanwhile, that same year, the Montreal Canadiens won their 23rd Stanley Cup, while the Expos limped to a fourth-place finish before barely one million fans at Olympic Stadium. O'Keefe, after losing money on their existing contract, abandoned their sponsorship of the Expos in 1985. Labatt agreed to take over the broadcast sponsorship in 1986. It was the same contract, five years, 35 million, but the going rate had increased significantly since 1980. Then after the 1986 season, budgetary concerns forced the Expos to trade Jeff Reardon to the Twins while losing Tim Raines and Andre Dawson as free agents, though Raines would famously re return in May of 1987. It took until 1987 for the roof on the Olympic Stadium to finally be completed. Growing increasingly impatient with the Expos by 1989, Charles Bronfman ordered all hands on deck to win a pennant that season. Early efforts to improve the team failed when a trade that would send Tim Wallach to the Boston Red Sox for Wade Boggs fell through. On May 25, 1989, the Expos traded, traded three young pitchers, including 6-foot, 10-inch Randy Johnson, to the Seattle Mariners for impending free agent Mark Langston. Initially, Langston brought promise to the Expos, propelling the team to first place by mid-June. But contract squabbles became a distraction. The team fell to fourth place in the final eight weeks of the season. Late in the season, as the Expos prepared to face the St. Louis Cardinals, at, at home, Charles Bronfman invited Hugh Hallward, an investor in the team, to dinner at an Italian restaurant in Montreal. His opening words were, You know what this means, don't you? The Expos were for sale. The Expos were sold to a Montreal-based group led by former Seagram's executive Char Claude Brochu in June of 1991. And uh, Mike, Mike Ortman, he's wearing your sweater. And for those who don't speak French, <laughs> yeah, Mr. Brochu, your sweater's upside down, and he's saying not at all. End of an era, 1985, 84 wins, third place. 1986, fourth place. Third, third, fourth, third. The legacy of the Montreal Expos from 1969 to 1990, they never won a World Series. They never won a National League pennant. One division title. They lost $44 million from 1969 to 1989, by which time the Blue Jays, not the Expos, had become Canada's national team. And those of you who attended an Expos game, on June 24th, 1990, we'll remember that the national anthem was booed prior to the game. There's Yuppie wearing not even a baseball jersey, but a New York Rangers sweater in front of Olympic Stadium. The Expos moved from Montreal to Washington in 2004. Gary Carter died of cancer on February 16th, 2012, age 57. The nostalgia factor gave the Expos a newfound sense of popularity as, express, as expressed through exhibition games, memorabilia show, and even a street was renamed after Carter after two, uh, in 2013. In 1973, the Montreal Expos emblem was an oddity. By 1985, it was an established major league symbol. When you consider the legacy of the Expos, I think we can reach this conclusion. The mayor was a salesman. Thank you very much.
If you have a question for our presenter, Maxwell Cates, tonight, go down to the bottom of the screen and hit the react button. You will then see raise hand. Click that button to raise your hand and you are in to ask questions of our presenter tonight, Maxwell Cates. Max, I want to ask you, <clears throat> you mentioned this in uh, Minneapolis to me. As a matter of fact, uh, you, uh, we were with, if I recall correctly, Patrick uh, Carpentier from uh, Montreal. And he made the, he asked if you had thought that the city of Montreal would ever get a major league ball club again. And what was your response? My response was the same as Sonia's response to Bronfman about getting a stadium. Definitely not. Why do you think that? Because the problems that existed in 2004 when the Expos left have not been remedied 20 years later they still don't have a stadium unless they want to go back to Olympic Stadium which nobody was interested in, in then there's no place to build a new stadium along a subway line there's customs is still a problem taxation is still a problem the weather is still a problem the exchange rate is at least as bad if not worse and don't major league ball clubs take in in their uh take in funds in their native country but they must pay their players in US funds as far as i know there's only one player who's ever asked to be paid in canadian funds and that was bill stoneman when he played for the expos it was one of the brief times in history that the canadian dollar was actually worth more than the american <laughs> bill bill stoneman was an, a us citizen but he married a canadian woman and they wanted to build a house in a suburb of montreal and he thought he could get a better term on his mortgage if he were paid in Canadian funds. So yeah. as far as I know, in 15,000 or more players in Major League history, there's only been one player who's ever been paid in Canadian funds. I just, for, for somebody like me who watched the Expos for years, I don't know if it's the, the nostalgia talking or what, but... Every time somebody mentions the word expansion in Major League Baseball, the first place that I go to is Montreal. I I live here in rural rural New Hampshire. I don't know the um, the politics of Canada, and I haven't been to Montreal in years. But it 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 it's sad to me that they can't rekindle that um that idea let's go to uh ryan mcclanahan ryan unmute and you are up to ask a question of maxwell cates yeah thank you this is really great i i really enjoyed this uh, so you. in 1994 uh do you think that the uh expos would have won that world series the it, short answer to that won? question is we'll never know that, yes, the Expos had the best record when the season ended, but since when does having the best record guarantee that you're going to win the World Series? The Seattle Mariners won 116 games and didn't even make the World Series. There's all sorts of examples you can point to. The Expos got hot at a particular point in the season. Tim Raines pointed out that nobody was picking up guys at the trading deadline because they knew they were going to go on strike two weeks later. The Expos were typically a, a team that did not pick up players at the trading deadline because they couldn't afford them. We don't know what would have happened with injuries. There's so many unknowns. But I think if people want to get upset about 1994, what they really should get upset about is 1993. Because without, without an event that took place in 1993, the catastrophe which followed 1994 could have been averted. 1991, 1991 as I had mentioned... Charles Bronfman sold the team to a consortium led by Claude Brochu. They finished in last place. The next year, against all odds, they finished in second place. Quite a turnaround. And cost accountants had had said that if you if you want to break even, you need a season ticket base of 17,000. Wow. How many season tickets did they sell that winter? 92, 93? 8,500. The owners realized that they bought a lemon. And when the team had a cash call, not one of the investors would invest more money into the team. If people, if 
if the investors were willing to fund the team, they might have been able to keep their players longer. They thought that they were going to help defray the costs by trading a young player on the verge of a big contract for an unproven rookie. And that was Delano to Shields. They traded him to the Dodgers for a relief pitcher with control problems. Now that trade backfired because the guy they got in return turned out to be Pedro Martinez, who was one of the best pitchers in, of his time. <laughs> and so I think if people, if people want to get upset over losing the Expos and the demise of the team, the people you need to get upset at are the owners who wouldn't fund the team in the first place. Alex Stace, you're up. Great, thanks. Good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I would point out that Montreal is the only team, only city until Oakland, as of last week, that lost a team that hasn't gotten one replaced, right? So the other teams, like Washington, got backfilled by Montreal, of course, and in other cases, people moved out. So I think we all kind of are romantic about the Expos, but um, you know, I think that's part of the reason. I would also say that I think people outside of Montreal, like all of us, have this romantic notion of the team that is belied by the actual lived experience of Montrealers and the uh, realities on the ground, as, as you just outlined. Um, I guess one question I would have for the group, really, is do you think that this Expo experience, well, has tainted the possibility of Vancouver getting a team? which doesn't come up terribly often. The people think that Canada is just not a good market. Or would I, you say Canada without a roof is uh, is not a good market? I have an answer to your question. I'll let others give their answers first. Wasn't Vancouver up for a expansion franchise in, I think it was not the, in, the, in the 90s, when Colorado and uh, Arizona got in? Weren't they on the list? They were on some list, I'm sure. Well, Van Vancouver got, um, they got a new stadium in 1982 that was called uh, BC Place Stadium. It was very much like the Metrodome. Yeah. And at the time that, um, at the time that Miami and Denver got their teams, the time that Miami and Denver got their teams, Vancouver was, in, was indeed one of the cities being considered the reason I, there, there's a, there are a few reasons I think Vancouver won't get a team and not, not, and they're not the same reasons as Montreal one later in the nineties, Seattle was, was given a new stadium. It, they didn't draw too well to, to the kingdom, but once they moved into Safeco field or T-Mobile park or whatever it's called now, they started to draw a lot better and major league baseball would worry that having two teams so close to each other would, would hurt them both rather than help one. That's why I think they've been reluctant to go to Vancouver and they've been re reluctant to go to, to Portland. That stadium BC place still stands, but it's really that type of stadium has really gone out of vogue. I mean, look where the Metrodome is now doesn't even mm. exist. And you would need to build a new stadium. Vancouver is also the global headquarters of Greenpeace. Good luck getting a stadium ma mandate past those people. They're pretty powerful in Vancouver. I didn't know that. Well, That's it, interesting. <laughs> as I put in the chat, I mean, I think you need retractable. I mean, the re I'm in Seattle, so, I mean, it's a great stadium, but it has a retractable roof, and those cost a lot of money, and Seattle has some money, so it all worked out, but... Hmm. You know, in the future, with all the rain you have in the east, whatever, I think the retractable roof, I mean, the Atlanta debacle last week could have been avoided with a retractable roof. I mean, that's the way things are going in baseball. And you need to be able to come up with billions of dollars to do that, in my opinion. So people need to bring cash to the equation. I think the Atlanta debacle had a little bit to do with gamesmanship by the Braves anyway. Um, I, 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 that, that smelled bad. As, as the the layers were unpeeled on that, Alec. Well, the Mets the Mets could have played on Monday. They didn't want to play on Monday. It wasn't just the Braves. The Mets didn't want to play on the Monday. Well, the doubleheader was scheduled for Monday, right? No, no, it was it was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. 
but it, they talking, rescheduled, the rescheduled games were for oh, the worse. rescheduled. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, we would have avoided the whole thing with a retractable roof or if true. the Mets agreed to play two weeks ago today instead of wanting to play on the Thursday. That's true. Molly, you're up. Um, Max, I just wanted to say thank you, first of all, and sorry for interrupting, but I thought you would be upset if we didn't see the slides. Well, I'm, I'm, gl I'm glad you pointed that out. I, I knew that if there was going to be a screw up in the presentation, given who's given the presentation, it would have something to do with technology. That turned out to be correct. <laughs> uh, so at least since I predicted Cincinnati over Oakland in 4 in 1990, I've got one baseball prediction right in my lifetime. There you go. I was just wondering if you could hold up that thing you were trying to show us earlier. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We forgot oh, about that. Yeah. Oh, you mean, uh, you mean this? Yes. I believe that's one of Dixie's calendars. I believe it is one of Dixie's calendars. It is one of Dixie's calendars. This, Dixie, I know you take credit or blame, depending on whose perspective, Both. On, my, on my Saber membership. And you're absolutely right, because when I got this calendar from my parents from the Sports Page Bookstore in Ottawa in 1989, this was the first time I'd ever seen the letters S-A-B-R as an acronym. On the back page, Ed Watchdog Brinkley, Sabre, Phil Bergen, Sabre, Barbara Flanagan, who I later worked with on a project, Sabre, Bill Dean, Sabre, Mark O'Conan, Sabre. Look at all these Sabre. What does that mean? I don't know. Now you know. Now there I you know. Go. And, and Dixie is one of our, our cherished uh, members up here. So you betcha. So Mike was in line before Dixie. So Michael Orban, where have you been lately, Michael? How are you? You're on mute, buddy. Un unmute, my man. I was thinking you had to take me off mute, but that was earlier. Um, thank you. And yeah, I've been glad to be here tonight. And Max Maxwell, thank you for being with us. And thanks for everything you had to say tonight. I don't know um, how familiar you are with Nationals Park but in Washington, D.C., we had that same kinship with Montreal that I think all of us felt for Oakland this year. The pain a city feels and baseball fans feel when they lose a team, it doesn't go away. And, and I had to deal with it for 33 years in Washington. And, and I will tell you that the ring of honor in Washington, DC at the, at the at nationals park, it's complicated because they have to pay homage to the team that left for Minnesota. And that includes everybody from Walter Johnson to Harmon Killebrew and the team that became the Texas Rangers. That includes, you know, Frank Howard, then there's this gap, and then the Negro Leagues are also represented on the Ring of Honor. You'd be happy to know that there are three Montreal Expos on the Ring of Honor at Nationals Park. Tim Raines, um, he said uh, Gary Carter, and... Andre Dawson, probably. Andre Dawson, yeah, that's right. So it's interesting that there's that, there's that respect for a city, even though the three of them never played in Washington. Uh, my question for you is, in your, you mentioned Dave McNally briefly as one of those influxes in 75. Came yes. from Baltimore, twilight of his career, his arm was dead. Uh, but he also played a key role in that free agency journey with Andy Messersmith. The two of them were the players on that case. And as legend has it, uh, McHale wound up showing up miraculously in Billings, Montana, to offer Dave McNally what amounts to a bribe. And Mike, to, you know, come back next year and pay a bunch of money, you can bring your family to spring training, all kinds of things. Even though McNally knew, he, while he was out of contract, uh, that if he signed that contract, it would essentially, he and Messersmith did the same thing, it would at least forego free agency for another year and buy the owner some time. Did Bronfman, did, did you learn anything additional to what I just said about what Bronfman may have had to do with that? Or is there any backstory that we didn't hear about? What I do know is that if you look at a 1976 Expos media guide and you look at all the player profiles, you will see non-roster player invited to spring training, number 20, Dave McNally. He was, that's true. Even though he was done playing. Even though he never showed up at spring training. He was working at his, um, was it a Ford dealership that he had or a Chevrolet? Yeah. He was a key player that gets often gets ignored because he was done playing. But by turning down the Expo's bribe, yeah. he wound up feeding the free agency and the decision that ultimately resulted in what we now know as free agency. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm going to touch on something that Alex said a minute earlier when he was talking about Montreal and Oakland as being the only cities to lose a team and never get one back. There's a third city, actually. People who, who are in the group, I don't know if there's anybody here from Brooklyn, but 
<laughs> Ask anybody from Brooklyn. Are they from Brooklyn or are they from New York City? Right. Yeah. <laughs> you can take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you can <laughs> never take Brooklyn out of the boy. Before I go to Dixie, I'm noticing that uh, Barbara, do you have your hand up? Did you want to ask a question, Barbara? If you do, there's there's a button down the bottom or you've got to unmute yourself You down the bottom of the screen. Are you if are you, if you're shaking your head? No. Does that mean you're OK? If you. I I do not believe that she's uh, wanting to ask a question. We will go back to her if she does. Dixie, you're up. Oh, this is an open question for everybody on screen, I think, but I can't prove it, that I am the only person on the screen that has seen a game at Jerry Park. Has anyone Ooh. else seen a game Ooh. at Jerry Park? Oh, Bill has. I saw Steve Rogers shut out the Big Red Machine in 1975. Wow. Three to nothing. In July. Any baseballs going to the uh, swimming pool out there? No. No. <laughs> Ryan McClanahan uh, actually made a comment in the chat. His comment was, isn't anybody going to mention Pete Rose's half year in, in Montreal? Maxwell is silent. <laughs> got his 4,000th hit with the Expos. Got his 4,000th hit with the Expos. He <laughs> uh, he got his 4,000th hit, 4,000th hit off Jerry Kuzman, who was pitching for the Phillies at the time. And we're all amongst friends. I can tell you this story. Pete Rose and Jerry Kuzman both served time for committing the same crime of <laughs> failing to declare their income from baseball card shows. That's right. Yes. <laughs> but um, when Pete... When Pete Rose joined the Expos in 1984, even though the team was on the way down, they were still promoting the team as being on the way up. And they, and it was being promoted, oh, we've got 3,990 hits. Here's the guy who's going to take us over the top. Well, they got him because Philadelphia got rid of him. Not only that, but Pete Rose, he was a, a polarizing player, and he drove a wedge through the clubhouse. It was no longer sort of the fun atmosphere that it had been. I mean, yes, there was the whole Carter versus Dawson rivalry, but it was essentially a collegial atmosphere. Pete Rose comes in, and all of a sudden, it's a business. Pete Rose would do whatever he could to make money on or off the field. And would it... <laughs> he'd, he'd see... He'd see Gary Carter signing autographs in spring training and say, Gary, what are you doing? Don't you know you could get paid for that? Anyways... The one guy who couldn't stand Pete Rose was Terry Francona because he took his position. And Francona was another guy who was on the way up, and he blames Pete Rose for stunting his growth as a player in part. And by the team did okay in April, fell out of contention in May. By August, Cincinnati was looking to get a new manager, and the Expos were looking to get rid of this headache, this expensive headache named Pete Rose. And so off to the Cincinnati Reds he went. Like him or not, he adds to attendance wherever he played. And he won. I, I can't argue that point, Roger, but uh, uh, and you, you, know, you should turn your, your cam on so we can see you, my friend. But what I would say is that Rose carried a lot of baggage that didn't really come out until the Dowd report. But if I had to to guess, uh, I would say that the players knew. They knew what was going on with this guy. And in a lot of cases, they kept their distance from him. Uh, I may be wrong. I don't know. But Rose is, is a heck of a polarizing figure in his prime. He was spectacular. We all know that. But once the layers of the onion came off, he he devolved into something that a lot of players didn't want to be around. 
Uh, Roger, did you have something? Go. I understand that completely. Mm -hmm. It's a wonder that it was allowed to go on because it was yeah. known early in his Cincinnati career mm -hmm. that he was doing things immoral, illegal, and nobody said anything. Yeah. I know, but uh, in um, Keith O'Brien's book, I believe he mentions how Bench tried to, I think it was Bench who tried to do something, but didn't get um, very far. And I know that Bench said all the right things uh, in a press release after he died last week, but I, it's it was my understanding that that Bench didn't want anything to do with him. I might be, I don't know if I'm right, wrong, or different. Roger, can you comment to that? They hated each other. Uh, Rose was from Cincinnati. Uh, Bench came in and did so many great things. They did not get along at all. Uh, so uh, Bench trying to talk to Rose was like trying to talk to a wall. Uh, yeah. But um, a lot of things. Uh, Rose... When he was uh, just joining the club, the white guys couldn't stand him because he took the uh, place second base from a white guy. So he hung around with uh, Frank Robinson and the blacks and the reds didn't like that. So yeah, if he didn't produce well, he wasn't going to be on the club at all. Uh, Good point. He... Oh, yeah turn Philadelphia around. No, he did not do much in um, in Montreal. But yeah, coming back to the Reds, he didn't have the stats, but they won. Yep. I remember reading. And I think he hit what, like 250 for the, for the for the Expos for that half year, Max? I don't even think it was that high. Let me... It might have been 245 or something like that. Joe, we're going to go to you in a minute. That's all I've got. What, what I was going to, adding to Roger's point about Pete Rose, his last weekend alive, he was at a card show in Nashville, Tennessee, and you'll see the schedule. Saturday, or rather Sunday, Pete Rose was there with Dave Concepcion, Ken Griffey, George Foster. And yeah, there one was other a guy, picture out. And, and, and Tony Perez. Saturday, Johnny Bench was there by himself when Pete Rose wasn't there. Not surprised. Uh, that yeah. that was just because they wanted attendance for both games. You couldn't have Rose and Bench on one day. The next day would not have had any attendance. That was the reason. Pete Rose actually batted 286 for the Expos. He did? I'm sorry, really? 259, 286 on the season. He batted 259. Okay, all right. Because he the got on a hot streak when he went back to Cincinnati. The other anecdote that I like to share about Pete Rose is that when he hit number 4,192, then understood to be the record, it was against San Diego, and the catcher was Bruce Bochy. That's right. Now, who watching that game on television would have thought, one of those two guys is going to get in the Hall of Fame, and it's Bruce Bochy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Ross, you're up. Uh, first thing, um, Roger mentioned that uh, – Rose brought in a lot of money and all that. That's why he was ignored. You don't penalize the guy who sells the tickets. Money is the name of the game. If they win, they sell tickets. If they don't win, but Pete Rose was there, they sell tickets. That's called money. That's why they're there. It's a business, not a game. You and I think it's a game. And when I used to play Sandlot, it's a game, but it's a business. The other part of that is that if Pete Rose were not Pete Rose, but were Joe Smith, he would have been suspended a hell of a lot earlier. He, they let him get away with it because he's Pete Rose. And again, he brought in money. Money is still the name of the game. Winning is nice only because it brings in people, sells tickets. So the gate is important. But when you get a star like Pete Rose, and it's true in almost every sport, 
they bring people in. It makes money for the club. Everybody's happy. In women's basketball, you got Caitlin Clark, who did marvelous things for women's basketball. When I was younger, and uh, way younger, uh, and a basketball referee, uh, going back to the other part of it, the IRS clamped down on a lot of the big-time referees because they were, let me be called polite, under-reporting <laughs> the income they made from officiating games. Um, that obviously had nothing to do with money. That was just a periodic thing that I think the IRS said, hey, why don't we crack down on side money for a change? And they do. And then they leave it around, leave it alone for a while. They'll come back and do it again. Max, great, great presentation. Thank I you very it. much, Joe. Nice chatting with you. You too. Anything else for Max tonight? <clears throat> All right. Well, this has been a lot of fun. It's a great presentation. It's very interesting to hear about the history that we don't get down here, at least, of the expo. So, Max, I want to thank you for this. This has been fantastic. Well, thank you once Here. again for having me. It's absolutely uh, my friend. Always nice to make an appearance and see people. And, well, and we are uh, going to be back Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern with another special presentation brought to you by the Sabre East Coast Cooperative. Our guest will be another Sabre 52 presenter and Danny Spiewak, who will give his talk Cardinal Dreams, the legacy of Charlie Pete and a life cut short. The sign up link was sent out this morning in our Monday message, and it's available in the Sabre events calendar. And finally, if you're a baseball fan watching this on YouTube and you like what you see, please like and like this video and subscribe to our channel to be alerted to each of our uploads. And if you're not a member, you need to join the Society for American Baseball Research, the premier baseball community, offering an amazing baseball buffet of options to explore your fandom. Sabre boasts more than 35 different research communities, over 80 regional chapters, and innumerable opportunities to connect with baseball minds across the world. For more information, go to sabre.org slash join today. Max, you're fantastic. Thank you Thank very you. much for doing this. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. Let's get everybody out of here. We'll see you Wednesday night. Have a good night, everybody.